everybody. Welcome to church. It's so good to be with you today. Whether you're in the room, you're joining us online, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Chris. I'm up here with Carla and Angie, a wonderful band, and a special welcome to you. If this is your first time here, it takes a lot of courage to step into someplace new, but you're here today, and we're so glad that you are. We don't believe that there's a better place that you could be than right here with us. And we're gonna do some singing together. And we sing and we worship every single week because we believe that something wonderful and good and powerful happens when we do because of who we are singing these songs to and who we are singing these songs about. Today we're singing to a God that walks with us through this life. A God that invites every single one of us to experience hope and freedom and life through him. No matter where we've been in this life, He's a God that loves us, a God that is for us. And when we worship, when we sing together, it's our opportunity just to say, thank you, Jesus, for who you are, for all that you've done in my life, to put him above everything else. That's why we sing, that's why we worship. So I wanna invite you to stand with us today. We're so glad that you're here. Let's sing together. Here we go. Sing your word. Your word is a lamp unto my Joe! 
sing this out. Your presence is in all.
Let's pray together. Jesus, sometimes it's not easy to sing, you are holy. But would you help us, no matter what season of our life we're in right now, would you help us have the strength to look past our circumstances, to look past what we experience, and use the very breath that you have placed in our lungs to worship you, to glorify you, to praise you, because you are worthy of it, Jesus. Whatever we experience in this life, you experience with us. You walk with us. You meet us where we're at. You're always with us. Jesus, thank you so much for who you are to us, how you love us. Would you help our gratitude and our worship not be dependent on what we face? Thank you for who you are. We pray all of this in your mighty and your peaceful name, Jesus. Amen. So good to sing with all of you. Go ahead and grab a seat. Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Jeff and welcome to Eagle Brook Online. Our hope is that this is a place that feels more like a church than it does a podcast or content that you'd take in on your drive into work. I think one of the main things that separates a podcast and a church is the community. We are a community of people all around the world who unite under the message of Jesus with the mission of reaching people for Christ. And in our online church, there are two main ways that you can connect to our community. The first is through small groups. These are groups that primarily meet over video chat from anywhere in the world. They connect on a weekly basis for about 10 weeks each session. The purpose of these groups are to connect with each other and grow in our faith. And it doesn't matter if you're brand new to faith or you're a biblical scholar, these groups are open to everyone. The fall session kicks off on the first week of October, but the directory to explore groups and to sign up for them is live right now. To check that out, go to eaglebrookchurch.com groups. The other main ways that you can connect to the Eaglebrook online community is through viewing groups. These are local groups that meet together in the same place to watch Eaglebrook online together. The concept is pretty simple, but the impact is incredible. You may have heard us mention that we launched three new groups on fall kickoff just a couple of weeks ago. One in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, the other two are in Minnesota, one in Hancock and the other in Mankato. All three of them had amazing starts, ranging from 11 to 30 people on their launch. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate how simple starting one of these groups is. So I'd like to briefly tell you the story of how these three groups got started. The one in Eau Claire started with Holly, one online attender who wanted to see a viewing group in her city. She happened to have access to a conference room through her work. We worked with her, answered some of her questions, gave her advice on how to start well. And now there's a group in Eau Claire. The one in Hancock started with a group of moms, some who have attended an Eagle Brook campus in the past. They found a local space at an event center for the community. Now there's a viewing group in Hancock, Minnesota. Lastly, the one in Mankato began with a married couple named Paul and Sue. They contemplated having people in their homes, but they thought that if it grew, they wanted more space for people, so they contacted a local Christian school, and now there's a viewing group in Mankato. Maybe you felt a nudge to get a group started in your area, but maybe you've had reservations or questions and you just weren't sure where to get them answered. Well, after service today, we're doing a live viewing group host Q&A. It'll be over Zoom, and we would love for you to attend, learn, and ask whatever questions you have. To join, head to eaglebrookchurch.com slash live and click on the viewing group host tile at the end of service. But hey, with all that, we are gonna hand it over to Ryan for the message. I just don't think I believe in God anymore. My daughter has cancer and she needs a miracle. I just lost any sense of purpose. Seriously, I cannot pay my bills right now. I just pray my kids can survive this divorce. I can't stop drinking. I have like three exams this week and I'm so stressed out. It would take a miracle for me to forgive them. I just don't love them anymore. It would take a miracle for my dad to follow Jesus. Welcome to Eagle Brook Church. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of your weekend with us. We certainly do not take that lightly at all. Whether you are a regular church goer, a Christian, 
a person of faith or not, I believe that today's message is going to help us. In fact, uh, you may have stumbled into church this weekend. or Maybe a friend sent you this message. They sent you a link and said, hey, watch this because you might find yourself in a very special category of people that used to be Christian. And then something happened. And that's exactly what we are going to talk about today. We have been in a series entitled, It Would Take a Miracle. Have you ever had something in your life that you just thought it would take a miracle for that to happen? Today, we're talking about the miracle that you might think it would take to restore your faith, or perhaps restoring the faith of someone you love. When we did those cards on Easter where we asked people to write down a miracle that they would love to see in their life. One of the most common was for a spouse or child or loved one to come back to God. And I believe that today's message could perhaps help us do that. Now, for me, uh, my faith journey began when I was born, okay? My parents were pastors, so I found Jesus through a dictatorship, okay? I didn't have options, okay? If you had the option to choose Jesus and become a Christian, congratulations, okay? Had no choices in my household. You had to sit your butt down on the front row for three-hour services, and whether you wanted to or not, that was my life. Now, uh, I actually enjoyed my upbringing. I'll never forget the first time my parents purchased for me my very first Bible. I read it from the front to the back, and I, in particular had a fascination with the miracles of Jesus. And I was taught a basic way of living out my faith, WWJD. What would Jesus do? I just wanted to be like Jesus. If Jesus performed miracles, then I need to be performing miracles because to me, that's what it meant to be a Christian, especially for me at, at the beginning. But I was very selective on which miracles I wanted to perform, okay? Uh, water to wine at 13, nah, that's too much. That's too much, okay? Uh, multiplying food for a large group of people, eh, our cafeteria often serves sloppy joes. I thought that would make lunch a little messy with a side of weird, you know, that'd just be odd. So I thought maybe resurrection. I ain't had nobody in my life that had died at that point, so I was like waiting for a funeral. Things got weird. Then I thought, you know what? The miracle that piqued my interest the most was walking on water. I thought, yeah, here we go. This is what I want to do. I remember reading that story for the very first time, and my next shower was very different. Okay, I thought, well, WWJD, let me go ahead and plug the shower and just let it rise. And I thought, I will rise with the water. This is going to be awesome. And you already know the rest of the story. I almost drowned. Okay, you got to be careful following Jesus. You understand? Like, for me, I I've been... A Christian my whole life. I went to a Christian pre-K, Christian elementary, grade school, high school, and college. I've had the privilege of watching hundreds and thousands of people start their journey of faith in Jesus. And unfortunately, I've seen quite a few people walk away from their faith. And maybe that's you or someone you love today that walked away. Maybe you're in the process of doing so. You're walking away, leaning away. Your frustrations are reaching a boiling point where your faith is hanging on by a thread. And I just got to encourage you this weekend, hold on, because a thread is all God needs to change your life. There's a guy in scripture, a Jesus follower, whose faith was hanging on by a thread. He wavered, he doubted, and his name is Thomas. Or you can get a little bit of his personality found in John chapter 11. It says, now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now this is a very, very good friend of Jesus, by the way. Now, verse 6 says this. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. 
But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Hey, Jesus, when people throw stones at you, sometimes they miss and can hit us, okay? And so then Thomas, the guy we're zooming in on today, he just levels with the whole gang, and he says this in verse 16. He says, let us also go that we may die with him. Hey, guys, today we're going to die. Who's excited? Like, like he just calling it how he sees it, you know? Like, like we'll often encounter two types of people in our life. You got your pessimist and you got your optimist. Some people say they're, they're self-acclaimed realists. They keep it real. I just always find it interesting that realists always seem to keep things real bad. Think about that for a second. Nevertheless, <laughs> we know we got optimists and pessimists. Optimists, well, these people, they don't have a lot of questions. They go with the flow. The glass is half full. They trust the government. They trust their employer, pastor. They trust everybody. In general, they believe the world is a good, happy place. They have a good reputation. People are like, oh, yeah, I like that person. That's great. But then you have pessimists. They get a bad rap. They lean a little bit skeptical. Do you know any skeptics? Do you know any pessimists? Do not look at those people right now. Okay, like, I need you to look up here. You're like, I know. I'm sitting next to one. Listen, pessimists. They got questions about everything, about everybody. The glass is half empty, and in fact, the glass might be a little dirty in their eyes. Like, there are just some people that just don't trust nobody. They don't trust the government, pastors, banks, airplanes, plumbers. Everybody is out to get them in their minds. They are not just going to blindly follow anybody. They got questions about Everything. Now, I think for you and I, we have to realize that there's, regardless of our pessimistic or optimistic disposition, I think any one of us can find ourselves in a Thomas-like place where it's difficult to be a follower of Jesus. Now, when Jesus was crucified, his disciples scattered, but then Jesus returned and revealed himself to his disciples. Scripture tells us that Jesus came, and he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and, and his side, and then the disciples were glad that they saw the Lord. But then John 20 tells us this. It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Hey, Thomas, we saw Jesus. He's back. Let's get the band back together. Thomas is like, nah, nah, nah. I ain't doing that. Nope, nope, nope. I need evidence. It's interesting because here's a guy who went from passing out multiplied food to thousands of people, carrying the very miracles of Jesus to other people, who's now in a place where his hand is on the doorknob of walking away all together. Here's a guy who witnessed Jesus heal blind eyes, open deaf ears, and bring people back from the dead, who is still struggling that Jesus could pull that resurrection trick off for himself. Thomas got to a place on his journey where his faith needed some evidence. Some people lose their faith altogether when their doubts begin to outweigh their beliefs. It's like they had a childlike faith that was met with grown-up realities, challenges, cancers, hurdles, divorces, firings, pandemics, bills, and interest rates. And now all of a sudden they got to a place where they find themselves looking for God and feeling like they're just talking to a ceiling. Some people lose their faith because they're swayed away by the temptations of this world. Some people lose their faith because of their doubts. Some people lose their faith because of their disappointments. 
when things didn't work out the way that they'd hoped, when they're faced with unanswered prayer, it's incredibly difficult to keep their faith. And then there are some people who end up walking away from their faith because of church. And not just church. Sometimes it's church hurt. Somebody said something, judged something, fired their friend, and they just, it hurt. Sometimes people lose their faith because of church people. <laughs> What's funny about every Christian is we all know at least one Christian that doesn't represent us very well, that we think is very weird, and we just think I'm a Christian, but I'm not one of those. And if this is what it means to be a Christian, then I don't want to be that. We don't want to be guilty by association. Maybe you witness hypocrisy, and it just, just sends you over the edge. Some people have lost their faith because of church politics, following church rules. You're in the crew until divorced. Some people have lost their faith due to the church response to politics. I can't tell you how many people I know who've walked away from their faith because the church supported or didn't support their political party of choice. Some people lose their faith because of church pastors. A, a pastor offended them or a pastor's lifestyle that they disagree with. Like, I know people who have walked away from their faith because they saw a pastor have a private plane, which I get why that might make one feel disgruntled, but I do have a question. Are you saying your faith would have remained strong and intact if you saw that same pastor on Southwest Group B? Are we saying if their bags fly free, your faith is good? I mean, sure, there have been some pastors and some churches that have abused their influence, but can I be your faith friend for a weekend? Is the faith that you have or lost in pastors, the church, Christianity as a whole, or is your faith that you have or lost in Jesus? Because if, if you lost your faith in God because of American politics, good. That faith was way too small anyway. Might I ask you to reconsider putting your faith not in the God of America, but perhaps the God of the universe. And I know in America, sometimes we think we're the center of it, but we're not. If you walked away from your faith because of hypocrites in the church, well, I hope you don't walk away from your job because there's hypocrites there too, okay? If you drifted away from your faith because of what you've seen in the church, can I please invite you back? Not to put your faith back in the church, but to put it back where it was supposed to be all along, and that's in Jesus. I think some of our faiths hinge on our church preferences, our favorite worship songs, our favorite speakers. Now, I think we all naturally have preferences that our families gravitate toward. But what's your plan for your faith if we don't sing your favorite songs? Or your favorite speaker isn't teaching that weekend, regardless of what the church is or isn't doing, that you favor. Your faith can be strong. In fact, I think our church preferences have the capacity to actually distract us from what our faith should actually be in. I have an encouraging text that I send out every week, and in one week I sent out a text asking people, hey, do you have anything that, that I could pray for? And, and about half of the people responded in, in a day, and it was overwhelming. And I just, I just have to, it, it, it blew me away, because you want to know what they needed not my opinion on the state of the church. No, like, like they need it. A little bit of faith that the same God that they read about could show up in their marriage and help them forgive. They needed a little bit of faith that the same God they hear preached about can somehow meet them 
in their classroom that the same God that they sing to would be the same God that meets them in their darkest moment. It served as a reminder to me that the world needs faith in something bigger than themselves and bigger than their circumstances. It served as a reminder to me that every now and then, I need to get over my grievances with the church at large and what I think the church should be doing and remind myself of why I put my faith in Jesus in the first place because a man came, predicted his death, burial, and resurrection and pulled it off. I would say I would follow that guy to this grave, but that's the beauty of following Jesus. When you try to follow him to his grave, you get resurrection, and dead things come back to life, and relationships can be restored, and miracles can happen. Now, for me, on my journey of faith, I've gotten some bumps, and I've gotten some bruises, and I bet I'll get some more in the future. But I still believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And he is the cornerstone of my faith. Even when my experience with his people hasn't always been ideal. Funny thing, I'm one of the people that hasn't been ideal (laughs) on somebody else's journey. Can I encourage you this weekend? In case you've lost your faith in the church, in case you've lost your faith in pastors, in case you've lost your faith in people. Don't let your lack of faith in people keep you from putting your faith in Jesus. Because what's interesting is the more that you and I put our faith in Jesus, the more flawed we truly realize that we are in just how much we need Jesus and his flawed followers to help us live out God's purpose for our life. I know the guy that we've looked at today, Thomas, he needed some other flawed followers of Jesus to stay on mission and to keep his faith. In fact, at one point, he's looking at his fellow Jesus followers, and he's going, you're all nuts. I need, you're just going to believe, no, 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 I need to see it for myself. I'm not just going to take your word for it. And, And I just love that this is the next verse. In Thomas's story, it says this, eight days later, eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them eight days later, which means the other disciples gave Jesus and Thomas time to figure things out. And then I just love what it says next. It says, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hand and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. You know what I love about this story? I just love that Thomas was in a small group with his doubts. I believe if we're going to get our faith back, we have to have a healthy relationship with a community of faith, which includes having healthy expectations for that community of faith. You're on a journey of faith that looks vastly different than my journey, but that doesn't mean we can't break bread together and give each other the space we need to grow in our faith. Whether you like it or not, following Jesus is a group activity, and it's been that way from the beginning. If you're the person here today with some doubt, I think something that is vitally important for you is who you surround yourself with when you've got those doubts. And I also think that we should take a page out of the Thomas playbook And just don't take someone else's word for it. It's an oxymoron to look for answers about God without God. No, no, no. Go to the source. Thomas said, I'm glad y'all think Jesus is alive. But I need to see it for myself. 
I think this is good for our faith. And I'm just glad Thomas's community allowed him to live there. If you're the person with someone in your life who's struggling with some doubts and have some questions about their faith, I think it's vitally important that you give them the grace and space to allow Jesus to reveal himself to them. Now, here's what's interesting. Jesus met Thomas where he was, revealed himself to him, gave him the evidence he needed. Thomas says, my Lord, my God. He recognized that Jesus was who he said he was all along. But Jesus didn't leave him there. No, he challenged him. And I believe he's challenging us to go to the next level in faith. Uh, Jesus said to him, uh, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I believe we serve a God who deserves all the honor and all the praise and all the worship. But the decision that you and I have to make is not if we'll give that to God. I think the decision that you and I have to make is when we'll give that to God. Some people pray for a promotion, and when they see it happen, they sing from the mountaintops, as they should. But Jesus applauded a group of people that are willing to sing and worship before they get their evidence, before they get healed, before they get married, before they make partner, before their kids return home. You want to see real faith? Worship before a miracle and after a disappointment. I was working out at Lifetime Fitness, and, and a woman, she came up to me. She says, hey, I'm really sorry to, to interrupt you, but there, there's a phrase you often use in your messages where you say uh, the people that impress you the most are parents who've lost their kids but have the faith and courage to walk through the doors of a church and sing about the goodness of God for 20 minutes. I've, I've said it quite a few times because it's true. And she looked at me with tears in her eyes. And she said, I'm that parent. I'm that parent that lost my child. And he was three weeks old. And every time you use that phrase, I think God sees me. And I just looked at her and thought, I want that faith. I want that kind of faith. I can stare down disappointment and lift my hands in worship and tell God how good he is for 20 minutes when it's very, very difficult to see it at all. You want to know what's interesting to me? Is that a lot of people who I think should have given up on their faith haven't. And I think that's why it's called faith. I can't speak for you. But I want the kind of faith that doesn't hinge on my preferences. I want the kind of faith that trusts God's goodness even when I can't see it. Jesus' encouragement to our friend Thomas. Hey, Thomas, you've had a front row seat to seeing the greatest man to ever live. You got to see signs, you got to see miracles, and you got to see wonders. You have felt the holes in your Savior's body, but there are millions and millions and millions of people who will never get that experience. So, hey, Thomas, Go and help them believe anyways. I want to close today's message with showing you a verse you may not have noticed before if you are familiar with the final words of Jesus Christ. In the final words of Jesus in Scripture, it's often referred to as the Great Commission. And it says this. It says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, 
All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the great commission. But inside the great commission is a group of people who some worshiped, yet some doubted. Some worshiped, some doubted. And Jesus looks at those worshipers and looks at those doubters at the same time and says, the invitation is still on. You would have thought Jesus would have like fixed it. And be like, well, hold on a second. Can't you see like you would have, you would have think he'd have made one final pitch. He just said, no, I, I see the worshipers and I see the doubters and you're not out of the band. Now let's go change the world. I just love that Jesus empowered the worshipers and the doubters at the same time before he left. Oh, I just want to encourage somebody today. If you're here and some things just don't add up for you and you've got some questions and dare I say some doubts, there's a disciple that made the Jesus roster to change the world. And so do you. Maybe you thought your doubts disqualified you from being a part of a community of faith. Maybe you thought your pain or your hurt disqualified you. But Jesus looked at some worshipers and looked at some doubters and gave them the same mission at the same time. So it was game on, faith on. And he's going, here's the deal, even if you've got some doubts, bring them along for the ride, because I'm sure we're gonna run into somebody else that has the same questions and has the same doubts. And thank God you're on the team with us anyways. So if you're here this weekend, and you've lost your faith, or you're watching this and you've lost your faith, I'd love to invite you back home. Not to put your faith back in the Eagle Brook Church, but to put your faith back in a heavenly father who sent his one and only son to die for you. Sometimes, I'm in a Thomas-like season where I have my doubts. And yet, uh, people will come and ask for prayer. And, I, and guess what? I pray every single time. Because guess what? Th this is what I've learned about God. On my 37 years on the planet, Jesus doesn't heal based off of my mood. He heals based off of what he's done on a cross for you and for me. So yeah, sometimes I find myself in the category of being a worshiper and a doubter at the same time, but guess what? Invitation is still on to go change the world. I wanna give each and every person here today an opportunity to put their faith in Jesus Christ. And maybe for you today, it's the first time, or maybe today, you're rededicating your life to Christ. And perhaps this is the next step for you in restoring your faith. I love what Revelation 3.20 says. It's Jesus speaking. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with I don't know what happened in your past that made you lose your faith, but I do want you to know that Jesus is available to you today, and he's standing at the door of your heart, and he's knocking. The question is, will you let him in? In these next few moments, I'm, I'm going to say a prayer for all of us, and I'd ask that you would join with me as we consider what it would look like for us to 
make a decision to surrender our life and put our faith in Jesus. Father, I thank you so much for sending your one and only son to die for us. We look at our past mistakes, we look at our past sins, and we realize that we could not do for ourselves what your son has done for us. And so today, we put our faith in Jesus. For some of us, it's for the first time. For some of us, we're, we're rededicating our life to Christ. So Lord, we ask for forgiveness. We ask that you would come into our heart and that you would be the Lord of our life. For our faith is not in what we can do on our own, but our faith is in what you have done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never taken this step of faith by making a decision to follow Jesus before, uh, will you do something for us today? Would you text the word BEGIN to the number 77888? Again, that's BEGIN to the number 77888. Because what we want to do is we want to help you on your new journey of faith. We're going to send you 12 weeks, three months worth of resources to help you grow in your faith or perhaps to get it back. Now, in these next few moments, we're going to spend a few moments worshiping together. And at every location, there's going to be a prayer team down here at the front. And guess what we're going to do? We're going to pray for miracles. If you've got something in your life that you think, oh, it, it would take a miracle, today's your day. I believe we're going to exercise our faith in God in these next few moments. We're getting ready to sing a song called Waymaker. And we just believe that God is going to make a way out from nowhere. For some of you, that miracle is a physical healing. For others, that may be restoring a relationship that you think is too far gone. And for some of you, the greatest miracle you could experience today is getting your faith back. And I believe today is the day that you are going to see a miracle. So, at every campus, at every location, I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet and join us as we sing. Work, promise, keep light in the darkness, my 
the way maker, that you make a way when we cannot fathom what our next step is gonna be. God, you're right there. You are waiting with open arms for us. Jesus, you see us at our worst and you love us no matter what. God, thank you. Thank you that you have an unending, unbreaking kind of love. Jesus, 
We worship you because you're good, because you love us and you see us. So Jesus, we give you our heart, we give you our attention. Would you have your way in our life, Lord, because we need you. We pray all this in your powerful name, amen. Church, so good to worship with you in this place. If you need prayer, we're gonna have a prayer team down here who would love to meet with you. And if not, we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend, everyone.